uh, you know, people often ask me, what's your favorite Yiddish novel? And I actually don't have a single one, but this is one of the three. The other two have both been translated quite well. It's one of those rare novels that actually has everything. So it's got, you know, a lot of plot. It's got a lot of character. It's got a lot of fancy and unfancy language, but manipulated extremely well. When it comes to writing prose, Opatoshu had an amazing ear and an amazing sense of prose rhythm, which is something that many writers just don't have. Tell me about the book, about Emporio Chevelder. Uh, it certainly was his most successful work and continued selling briskly in the 50s as much as it did in the 20s. He's got, because of what he's talking about, uh, which is basically a guy's passage from the backwoods in Poland, the, back, the Polish backwoods in the 1850s, through the last major center of the Hasidic revolution, when Hasidism was still a revolutionary movement, or considered a revolutionary movement, rather than backward-looking traditionalists. They were forward-looking, you know, they were making up their own tradition. At the time, he passes through that when he goes to a town called Kotsk, ends up involved in or involved with highly polonized, highly assimilated Polish Jews, and remember, this is the 1850s, and getting involved in the movement that eventually led to the 1863 uprising in Poland, when the Poles, who had been conquered, as it were, but were occupied by, by Russia, Poland had been occupied by Russia, they rebelled against the Russians, tried to kick them out. It didn't work. But it was a big thing, you know, it was, uh, you know, the great patriotic uprising that's still, you know, in Poland, it's still a very big deal, the 1863 uprising. And there was a surprising amount of Jewish involvement in it. Um, tell, me, tell me about what you remember about your grandfather. Well, I, re I remember him quite vividly I spent a, an inordinate amount of time with him for most grandchildren. My parents would drop me off at my grandparents apartment every Friday afternoon and then pick me up again Sunday evening. He was phenomenally prolific. One of the uh, major Yiddish dailies in New York was the Tug and he was on the initial editorial staff of, of the Tug, but his basic job was that he wrote a story every week for the newspaper from its first issue, basically, uh, until his death. Fiction or nonfiction? All fiction. Short stories. Wow. Yeah, a short story every week. So this <laughs> heartbreakingly... Uh prolific body of work, how much is how much is in English and how much is readable in English? Uh, in English? Yes. Uh, very little. His first his first novella, which was uh, Romance of a Fergana, uh, uh, Romance of a Horse Thief, uh, was available for many years even in a paperback collection but it was just like the first third of it is what they published not the entire thing uh, there were a number of poor translations into English of other works there was the, there was one of Polish Evelda uh, in the 1930s that sort of missed the point of the entire book and, and and isn't really English, and it's not really Yiddish. I, I, I don't know. I want to. I want to circle back to. Well, see, I mean, I keep when you tell me these stories, I just think about myself. That I just I want to read these things. I want to. <laughs> I want to. I want to have the. Ch I want to read them today, and I also would like to be able to to choose at my leisure to read them next year. Or ten right. years from now, but but they're but they're not really being translated into English, and there's sort of an urgency 
now? I mean, what? Absolutely, what can absolutely. We do? Because the last non-purely academically trained Yiddishists, the ones who you really need for a good translation, who are really familiar with idiom, the idiomatic language in both English are very few and far between, as Michael happens to be one of them. Uh, I don't mean this to sound ageist, but because of the Holocaust, my generation is the last that is ever going to have had contact with people who lived in that top, as it were, top to bottom Yiddish world in Europe before the Second World War. I'm old enough that I knew people, you know, I had parents, I actually had grandparents. I, my grandparents, there, there were people older than them around too. And part of the, what happened to me when I was a kid was I would get stuck, my grandfather would look after me. So he and his pals, who were basically old retired men by this time, spent their time kibitzing and lapsing, nudging each other and look, pointing at me and then going into Polish or Russian. So I missed all of that. But also one of the things they would do was they were doing imitations of their old men. The guys, you know, their teachers, their grandparents. And I picked up a lot of this kind of stuff. And I'm, I don't think I'm the only person. But, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to be 59 in September. You know, how, how much longer can, how much, how long can a person live? 